Welcome to Numerical Methods. Now, in the last session, I started discussing uh, implementation, you know, the implementation of the concepts we have introduced in this lecture so far. So we are here in the section on implementation, and I had a few remarks in the beginning that we should design our program yeah, uh, with extensions in mind. For example, if the model has a drift yeah, that is currently a constant, like the log normal process for the Black-Schulz model, if you move to log coordinates, it's just a constant r minus one half sigma squared, or the diffusion parameter sigma, yeah, I mean log coordinates also just a constant. Yeah, we could uh, design it from the beginning by considering that it could be extended to models for which the volatility parameter is stochastic, is a stochastic process by itself. And we did here the first part that we discussed these things for the application of the valuation of a European call option under the Black-Scholes model. So I started a small programming exercise with you. So this is here in our lecture repository. And we defined some parameters for the model, for the product, for the time discretization. In this case, Black-Scholz model, if we move to log coordinates, we know the exact solution. It's just a single time step, so there is no time discretization. And then some parameters for the Monte Carlo simulation. And we had several implementation straightforwardly a loop, yeah, looping over all sample paths, collecting the payoff, maybe a bit shorter using Java streams, yeah, but also where we have a mapping here from the normal variable to the model and then a mapping from the model underlying to the product payoff, taking the sum. And then we introduced some interfaces and classes uh, yeah, that are responsible for a dedicated part in our pro problem. And these interfaces and classes, they were encapsulating the concept of a random variable. So we have a random variable. Often we just have pathwise operations on a random variable, add two random variables or multiply a random variable with a constant. Then we have the time discretization, which will be needed today. So, yeah, discretizing the time axis and having some convenient method that map indices to time points or indices to time steps. And maybe a bit bigger part was the Brownian motion. So the Brownian motion is actually defined. Yeah, this is a time discrete Brownian motion defined on a time discretization. And then it is a stochastic process. So at every discrete time, I have a random variable. So it combines the two previous uh, components. So a little bit, I'm now creating small components and I would like to combine them to solve my problem in an elegant way, designed for extensions such that we have in the end, the thing that I promised a little bit in the beginning of the lecture, when we discussed, okay, what is the aim of the lecture? That we have a laboratory where we can make very nice experiments by exchanging different different parts. So with the Brown in motion, the time discretization and the random variable, we had interfaces. So there's the interface of a random variable. For this interface, I have different implementations, single precision, floating point number, double precision, floating point number, and so on. There was the interface describing what a time discretization provides. And then there was an implementation for that. And then there was an interface describing what a Brownian motion provides. And yeah, implementations uh, of this interface. Maybe I will shortly have a recapitulation and review a little bit the implementations, but giving these things, the last thing we did in the previous session was that we implemented our 
problem of evaluation of the European option using the Black Schultz model now with these components. Yeah, so I had a random number generator, I had a time discretization. The random number generator and the time discretization is feeded in an implementation of the Brown in motion, which then provides us a Brown in motion. So it provides us an object implementing this interface. Okay, then we could ask here our Brownian motion, give me the Brownian increment. Yeah, that's just a single Brownian increment, the delta W is zero because we just have a single time step. Give me the Brownian increment. Then we defined the drift, the R minus one half sigma squared, and we could calculate from that the underlying the S uh, of capital T. Sorry, so there was a typo here that is an S of capital T. Um, so you see all arithmetic operations are now here on the level of random variables. So it is a little bit similar to what we have here for the streams. We get rid of this loop. But to some extent, everything is still a little bit explicit. And I would like to move now to a more general case where I would like to also consider an Euler scheme of a stochastic uh, process. Yeah, So this here are the parameters of my stochastic process. So this, this here are the parameters of the stochastic process that create S of T out of my Brown in motion and the parameters of the stochastic process. And this here is the financial product. So maybe I can find nice abstractions for this part yeah, and maybe, maybe that part. So this is what I would like to discuss uh, today. Uh, so having abstraction interfaces that separate the model and the numerical scheme. And the second part is that I would like to have then interfaces that separate the simulated model and the valuation of the financial product. And in the end, we will have a very flexible collection of components yeah, where we can value many different financial products with many different uh, models. Yeah using many different parameterizations or implementations for the numerical uh, scheme for the numerical algorithms. So the next mathematical concept which we need to discuss is that of an ethostochastic process. So I would like to create now the implementation for a time discrete ethostochastic process. And when we discussed the different discretization schemes. Yeah? Remember Euler scheme, Milstein scheme. Uh, we also had a small session where I was discussing the example of discretizing a log normal process. So that's actually Black Scholz model. Yeah? So dx is mu x plus sigma x dw, mu and sigma being constant. Um, you saw that, well, Milstein scheme had an advantage over Euler scheme, but the best technique is actually to move to a different coordinate to the logarithm of X and do Euler scheme there. And also when I motivated Milstein scheme, I had the same thing that I did a Taylor expansion and then yeah, uh, I plugged in this Taylor expansion or I used this Taylor expansion with Ito's lemma and we saw that actually Milstein scheme is Euler scheme in a different coordinate yeah, with an approximation. So a very efficient method is to consider a time discretization scheme for the Ito stochastic process on a transformed state space. So we ha will have some function, which I will call the state space transform. And this function will transform the variable I'm discretizing to the variable actually that is described by my stochastic process. And of course, the inverse. So this guy here, G, is the inverse of F, yeah? or put differently, F is the inverse of G. So G transforms the X. X is now the stochastic process I'm interested in into the 
variable that I'm discretizing. So I'm not discretizing the X, I'm discretizing here now the Y. So we perform an Euler scheme discretization of Y, which I call Y tilde. And then I transform Y back to the original X. So this is then my X tilde. Yeah? So given the stochastic process, DX is mu X DT plus sigma X DW, mu and sigma could be functions of X. Then we proceed the following way. We have a state space transformation, you know, G that maps X to Y. Then I discretize Y. So I do an Euler scheme for Y. And then I have a state space transformation from Y to X, so this is F, which then uh, makes the transformation back from Y tilde to X tilde. This is, to some extent, a generalized Euler scheme for e to stochastic processes. And since this is so important, and this method is often far better than using just Milstein scheme or some improved scheme on the original process, I would immediately like to implement this. Huh? So design a little bit for extension. If you would start with Bachelier model, yeah, for Bachelier model, you do not need a transformation. It is already a normal form. It has constant coefficient. You would maybe not go this route. So since you know for Black Scholz model, I like to move to the logarithm and maybe for other models, you like to also introduce some coordinate transformation. Let's consider immediately an implementation that takes also care of this um, possibility to to discretize a transformed variable. So this is my generalized Euler scheme for E to stochastic processes. So here Y denotes an n-dimensional M factorial E to stochastic process. So M factorial means that the Brownian motion is actually an M vector. So if we go back here to my little discussion of the Brownian motion, an M factorial Brownian motion is that the Brownian increment is an M vector, M independent components, uh, every time step also being indep independent. So the M factorial refers to the fact that this here is a scalar product. So this here is also a scalar product. So I have that lambda of Ti times delta W of Ti is actually a sum J from one to M. Lambda J times delta WJ. No? So my Brownian motion is an M vector, yeah, a column, and my coefficient in front of the DW is yeah, a row yeah, that also has a vector M. Um, then the lambda J's are itself vectors because this n-dimensional refers to the fact that my Y, yeah, my stochastic process, is in um, n dimensions, yeah? so n dimensional means that my y is y one to y n. Yeah? So this is really general. Yeah? So not like Black Schultz model where you just have a single variable. It could be a stochastic process that has multiple components. So that means that my lambda is actually in n by m matrix. The n coming from the dimension of the stochastic process and the m coming from the dimension of the Brownian driver. So you could 
n times n, yeah, every stochastic process could have its own Brownian driver. You could also have an n times one, a one factor model in higher dimension. All stochastic processes are driven by the same Brownian motion. So this is my general n-dimensional m factorial e to stochastic process. And this is the stochastic process I would like to discretize. So here below you see the Euler scheme. So this is the Euler scheme for the process y. But this is not the variable that I am interested in. So my model is a transformed variable. So there is a transformation function, a state-space transformation, f. So you see this f is mapping from Rn to Rn. Yeah? So y is an n-vector and x is an n-vector. So x is actually f of yeah, t and y. So this is now the setup I would like to consider. So I have a stochastic process Y. You could think, for example, Black-Scholes model in log coordinates. So the Y would be logarithm of S. Then you discretize this process. And since you are interested in stock in S, the F is just the exponential function. And this then, uh, if you apply exponential function to the Euler scheme, gives you that it is initial value multiplied with, or the previous value multiplied with exponential of mu delta t plus hmm, lambda, so sigma delta w. So you also see that here the mu and the lambda are the coefficients for the stochastic process y. So these are the coefficients of the stochastic process y. So the stuff that I mark now here in blue are a little bit the model parameters. Another model parameter we have is the initial value. So this initial value, y of zero, is of course just f inverse of x zero. And maybe I would like to consider the x zero as the fourth model parameters. So this stuff here describes the model. Yeah. So my model is described by x0, the mu and lambda for the process y, and the function f that transforms from y to x. So the function f has a name. This is my state space transform. And yeah, what I'm doing here with you is I discuss a little bit what are the components that should be yeah, gathered together in, a, in an interface and then an implementation. And maybe we sh would like to have a specification of a model. So I would like to have a class implementing an interface that provides initial value, drift, yeah, factor loading, so the lambda is called the factor loading and the state space transform. So the mu is the drift and the lambda is the factor loading. Yeah, The Brownian driver is the factor. So let's combine this in an interface, and I just call this interface now the process model. So we will have many different specifications for models, yeah? Black-Scholes model, Bachelier model. Yeah? So Black-Scholes is mu is r minus one half sigma squared, lambda is sigma, f is exponential function. Bachelier model, mu is r, Lambda is sigma. Actually, for the Bachelier model, there is uh, a subtle thing. The drift is RS. Uh, so you have to think a little bit. But uh, we can later look into an implementation. LIBOR market model, a huge interest rate model, where the Y is actually a curve of interest rates. Uh, so Y becomes a huge vector 
or has to model would be other examples. So this here is my process model. And given a process model, yeah, I now have the specifications of these functions here. I can create now the Euler scheme. So this implementation here will be my Euler scheme. So Euler scheme is the implementation. The interface is then the process. The process takes a model and creates out of a model a sequence of random variables. So we have the other components. It takes a model and creates creates a time discrete family of random variables. So all the operations you see here on the slides are defined in terms of random variables. So this is the next interface, the thing we have already defined. This is random variable. So to do this, the Euler scheme needs another ingredient. It needs the Brownian increments. So it needs the part that generates the Brownian increments. This is my Brownian motion. And the Brownian motion is a time discrete Brownian motion. So the information on of which time discretization are we using for the Euler scheme is already contained in the Brownian motion because we will provide a time discrete Brownian motion to the Euler scheme. So that means the Euler scheme already knows create the process Y on the same time discretization. So we need the time discretization, which is an input to the Brown in motion. So that was our interface time discretization. Okay, so now you see that we have, yeah, all the interfaces that we would like to define. Let's start here. So we operate on random variables. We create a time discretization. From that, we create a Brownian motion that provides normal distributed random variables on the time and discretization. Then we specify our model. So what are the coefficients of the Eto stochastic process? What is the initial value? And also for the generalization, what is the state space transform that is maybe most suitable for this kind of process? And that is then feeded into an implementation that creates the time discrete process on the given time discretization, the Euler scheme. So this is just a remark in the script that we consider the M factor process. Okay, so the remark that this here is a scalar product. Yeah. So the J's component, so this is the Y the driver for yj of this uh, scalar product. So the or j's row of lambda um, multiplied with the column vector dw is lambda jk dwk. Maybe I should use consistent notation and also write here k. So the index that goes over the factors is K, yeah? And lambda is now an N by M matrix. So it's the matrix lambda J, K, where J is the index that enumerates the components of the Y. Okay, so we have already considered this when we implemented the Brownian motion. Yeah? So the, my Brownian motion was already an M factor Brownian, Brownian motion. So that's already there. Yeah, example for the Plex-Scholes model, the setup would look like this. So this is my model. The stochastic process for S is RSDT plus 
Sigma as dW. I also have a numeraire, dN as Rn dt. So the Euler scheme for the numeraire, yeah, okay, for the numeraire, I know the exact solution. There's maybe nothing to do. So I just need an Euler scheme for S. So I will move to the logarithm, log Euler. So this means my state space transform F inverse is logarithm moves from X, which is my S, to Y. This also transforms the initial value. And my state space transform from y to x is the exponential. So my x is actually just the s. I have only a single Brownian driver. So there's a single Brownian motion. So the number of factors is one for the Brownian motion. And since I'm discretizing now logarithm of s, and my coefficients mu and sigma are the coefficients of the process y, so the transformed variable, so the, of the coefficients of the process log s. Yeah, you know, d log s is r minus one half sigma squared dt plus sigma dw. So this gives you then the parameters mu and lambda. So for the Black Scholes model, that's maybe easy. So in addition, what we did in the last uh, session, uh, I will also maybe shortly review the components of the last session. We introduce two additional abstractions, two additional interfaces. So the process model is the interface that defines the initial value, the mu, the lambda, the f. And now comes an important point, yeah? I did not have that on the slide for the Euler scheme. It also defines the numeraire n. Yeah? Because the numeraire n, why should that be defined here? So this is an example of my remark that when you create compositions, so you compose things together, you should consider what belongs together. So you should create some coherence that stuff that has a dependency should be close to each other. And an example for this coherence here was the drift and the numeraire, because they are both, say, consequences of what is your measure that you choose, yeah, QN, yeah, the numeraire is already visible there, and Gesanov theorem tells you that changing QN changes the drift. So if we go back here to our generalized Euler scheme, part of the process should also be the specification of the numeraire. So the numeraire N, is also a model parameter, yeah? Because mu is under which measure am I simulating, and n is, yeah, under which numeraire am I simulating, and the numeraire defines my equivalent Martingale measure. So my process model defines these parameters, mm, y, zero, the initial value for the process y, mu, lambda, f, and n. And we have different implementations here. Yeah, maybe we will have a look now. Black Schultz model, Bachelier model, a Heston model, a Merton model. Having this specification, we can then create the time discrete process. So this process provides the X tilde on my time discretization. And we have an implementation of this, namely just the Euler scheme 
from process model. So take a given process model and create an Euler scheme. Actually, I don't have another implementation because Euler scheme yeah, is enough since we have this state space transformation. So the Euler scheme now takes two inputs. It takes the inputs, which model should you use? So it takes a process model as an input. And what is the Brownian motion that should be used to generate the time discrete stochastic process. And note that the Brownian motion already contains the information which time discretization should be used. And also by the Brownian motion, you somehow inject which implementation of random variables are you using? Yeah, because you multiply the Brownian motion with the coefficient lambda. And if the Brownian motion generates a specific random variable, you multiply that random variable with the lambda. The outcome will be a corresponding random variable. So to some extent, yeah, there are subtle questions. Uh, this also contains the, uh, the random variables. So to some extent, this also contains the random variable implementation. So the Brownian motion provides the time discretization. Yeah, let's review this and then complete the exercise from last session that I would like to use now these things to implement the valuation of my uh, European option. Uh, actually, before I complete this, I will introduce another layer of abstract abstraction, but maybe we can do a, a first step. So very quickly, also repeat what we did last time, random variable. So we find in the library an interface, random variable that describes what can be done with a random variable. For example, you can add another random variable to a random variable, or you can calculate the expectation. Yeah, the expectation is just another name for average. Then we have different implementations, open type hierarchy, different implementations. For example, here, one that uses a double precision array. For this implementation, you see adding another random variable is just a loop. Yeah? So loop over all elements and create the sum. Calculating the average, the expectation is actually using, for example, Kahan summation to calculate the average. Time discretization, yeah, very trivial part. So there is an interface time discretization with some convenient method for an index, give me the time. For an index, give me the time step. For a given time, give me the index, also with some rounding. And of course, I need the number of times and number of time steps. And there's also an implementation, an implementation that just has internally an array, yeah, and it has some convenient constructors to create this time discretization. Third part already done in the last session, Brownian motion. So I have an interface describing what is provided by a Brownian motion. So this is here. So a Brownian motion gives me the Brownian increment at a given time index. Since I have a M factor Brownian motion, it provides me the Brownian increment for the corresponding factor. So if you hover here, you see you get the delta Wj of Ti. Of course, the Brownian motion knows its time discretization. Yeah? And you can ask for the number of factors. We have different implementations. For example, one is using Mersenne random numbers. So if you take a look how the Brownian increments are generated, this is done here. So you loop 
over all sample paths, then you loop over all time steps, you loop over all factors, you ask the Mersenne twister to generate a uniform random number, you use the inverse of the cumulative distribution function, and then in the end, you wrap this vector of floating point doubles in an implementation of random variable. Yeah? So this is just a factory that creates then my implementation of random variable so that I can write all arithmetic operations in terms of random variable. Maybe here's a thing, uh, subtle uh, thing yeah, where I could make a comment. You see that the order of the loops is here on the outside. I'm over all sample paths, then over all time steps, and then over all factors. Yeah? Um, maybe intuitively, you would have the sample paths in the inside. I don't know. Yeah? Um, but this here is the order that we should use if we go back to our session on random number generation. Yeah, maybe I can find the slide. So here's the slide related to the Mersenne twister. Yeah? And we had the remark that the random number generator is equidistributed in high dimensions. So it has good properties even in high dimensions. Well, this guy up to 623 dimensions. So I had the remark that random number generator can become poor, yeah? linear concurrential generators can become poor in high dimensions. And even for quasi Monte Carlo methods, you have to explicitly specify the dimension yeah, of the random number generator you would like to use. Yeah? If you think of Monte Carlo integration, the dimension of the integral you are going to calculate. What is the dimension of a stochastic process driven by an M factor Brown in motion discretized by, say, D time steps? Yeah, this dimension is M, the number of factors, times D. Because how many independent, normal distributed random variables are part of this game? Yeah, for every time step, every time step is independent, independent increment. For every time step, you have M normal distributed random variables. So the inner loop here is actually filling our vector. So if you think of Monte Carlo convergence, sequences of IID random variables. So this is actually filling our vector with IID components. And then we create, create the sequence over all sample paths of this vector of IID components. So how many independent components do we have? Number of time steps multiplied with number of factors. So that's the reason why these two loops are in the inside. They are populating one after the other my sample vector. Yeah? So I have all elements of the Brownian increments for all time steps. And this is one sample path of the stochastic process. Yeah, So this is one sample of the stochastic process. So if the random number generator is a one-dimensional random gener number generator that allows to populate dimension by calling him one after the other, this here is populating the dimension. So that was Brown in motion. Yeah. So I shortly reviewed here the implementation Brown in motion from Mersenne random numbers. Next thing is let's have a look at my interface specifying the model. So this is process model. So where do we find this? So this is in Monte Carlo model. This is my process model. So this is now an interface specifying the number of components, the dimension of the vector y, yeah? the state space transform. This is my function f, the initial state. So this is the initial value for the process y. So maybe I fixed my slide. 
on the slide I marked the X, but the thing provided by the model is actually the Y, the Y0, the initial state. The numeraire is specified, yeah? so at a given time, I provide the numeraire. I provide the numeraire as a random variable. For Black Scholes, you know, numeraire is well, just e to the rt is a scalar value. But for more general models, like for example, an interest rate model, the numeraire can be stochastic. It provides the drift. So this is my mu. Yeah, but actually my mu is um, a vector. So this is the mu, the mu one to mu d for the d-dimensional process y. It provides the factor loadings. Actually, the factor loadings is a matrix, but here I return a vector because I will already specify the component index. So for every time, but this time is the ti, and every component of the stochastic process, so this is the j, so this is the factor loading for the j's component of the process y, so for the dyj. So this is returning then an m vector if I have m factors in the Brownian motion. Yeah. So you need to build the scalar product lambda 1j dw1 to lambda mj dwm. And that's more or less is it. Yeah? So this is an interface describing what a model provides. So you can open the type hierarchy and look what models do we have. So there are a few base classes here, but then you see there are many different models. There's special year model, Black Scholes model, Heston model, Hull White model, is an interest rate model, Liber Market model, Merton model, and so on. Yeah. And also some other stuff in other extended interfaces. Maybe we have a look at Black Scholes model. So Black Scholes model is best discretized by moving to the log coordinate. So moving to the log coordinate means that my state space transform is the exponential transforming from y to x. The inverse is the logarithm. So I have initial state, drift, and factor loadings, which are just constant. So I can calculate them beforehand. So you see the initial state is the logarithm of the initial value. The drift is actually r minus one half sigma squared, so sigma squared divided by two. And the factor loading is just the volatility parameter. So I just calculate this once. Yeah, And all these guys are already here random variables. You can also pass them in as, yeah, you can also pass them in as float, as uh, double precision values as floating point numbers. Um, but since the interface is general and provides this as a random variable, I have to wrap this, I have to wrap it in, in some random variable. Okay, so you can also take a look at other special E model. So for the so for the Bachelier model, the state space transform is almost the identity, but since we have that ds is rs dt plus sigma dw. We make a little trick. Yeah? So I move to a transformed variable yeah? where I actually take e to the rt yeah? is um, a multiplicative factor. Yeah? So I'd actually, I'm not discretizing s, I'm discretizing s divided by e to the rt, which is actually the, then the martingale because this here is the numeraire. Yeah? So I'm just discretizing the martingale. ds divided by n is sigma dw. And then I just, when I move, want to move back, I just multiply here with the n with the e to the rt. So you see also for Bachelier model, there is a, yeah, State space transformation that makes the model then a little bit simpler. 
So the drift is actually zero then, because I have removed the drift by this transformation. The volatility is just a constant. So the time discretization scheme will be exact if I use this model specification. Heston model, and you can go through this. So now we have many different models specifying our process model as an input here to our Euler scheme. So my Euler scheme is then implementing process, which creates the time discrete stochastic process that we are finally interested in. So it's it creates the x tilde um, of two ti. So let's look at that guy. So this interface is then here. This is my process. So a process knows, of course, the model. And it just has maybe one important function. It can provide the x tilde of ti. Well, x tilde is a vector, so it will provide the x tilde j of ti. So, of course, it also knows the corresponding time discretization, so it knows how time indices map to time points. Let's have a look at implementations of this. And, well, there is maybe only one important implementation here, our Euler scheme. So this is our Euler scheme. So you see as input, it just has the process model and the Brownian increments. So this is actually my Brownian motion. And if you like to have a look, this is my Euler scheme. I set the initial values and then I loop over all time steps. I'm asking my model, give me the drift. Now, if you take a look into this function here, it's just delegating to the model, give me the drift. There is a similar function delegating to the model, give me the factor loading, apply the state space transform. So I'm asking here for the drift. And here I'm asking for the factor loadings. With the factor loadings, I'm calculating actually here the scalar product. So this at some product is just calculate the scalar product of these two vectors and sum it up. So it calculates the scalar product with the Brownian increment. Brownian increment was asked here. Yeah, and then this gives me the next value. So it applies the state space transform. So I get the next value y and apply the state space transform, get the next value x. The code here looks a little bit more ugly because it does this a little bit multi-threaded on different threads, but yeah, you could also write it single-threaded. Yeah, maybe I make a first step and use these guys now in our little coding experiment. So this was here. So we had this little coding experiment. Maybe I just run this program where we were calculating the European option value under the Black-Scholes model, analytic value, just using the for loops, the streams, and the random variable. And maybe I now create another implementation and this implementation sh should use maybe more parts from the library. So let's maybe call this just using the lib. And create the implementation. So the first step are the same, yeah, I need a random number generator, I need a time discretization, I need a Brownian motion. Okay, uh, but now I like to simulate Black-Scholes model. So let's just say, use as your process model, Black-Scholes model. So now you have to be a little bit careful. There is a Fourier transform implementation of the Black-Scholes model. 
So you see this here to the right, and there is a Monte Carlo implementation of the Black Schwartz model. I would like to have the Monte Carlo implementation. It takes three arguments, the initial value, the risk-free rate, and the volatility. And this is the class that now provides the initial value, the mu, and the sigma to my Euler scheme. Then create an Euler scheme process out of this model. So I now create my Euler scheme. Euler scheme from process model. It takes the process model, my Brownian motion. Okay, this is just an optional parameter. Okay, and this process is now a Monte Carlo process. And now I can ask this process for my underlying stock. This is now the random variable. So get the process value. Yeah, the time index. Okay, which time index do we need? I can ask my time discretization to give me the time index corresponding to my option maturity. And then the process has different vector components. This is just the zeros component I would like to see. So now he tells me this could throw an exception. So this could throw an exception because the Euler scheme could fail. Yeah? So maybe I just pass the exception through. And this is now my S, capital S of T. So I have now yeah, put this, yeah, maybe more explicit specification of calculating the underlying. I have put this into yeah, these two lines, take this model, feed it in this process, yeah. Okay, so I maybe I just saved one line, but actually I gained a lot of flexibility by now being able to specify just models by exchanging this single line. So I can uh, calculate now the discounted value. So maybe you would also say the model provides the numeraire. Uh, so the process model provides the numeraire. So I would like to have the numeraire at also the same time at maturity. And then you calculate the value. The value is the underlying divided by the numeraire. Actually multiplied with the numeraire at evaluation time. And from this, I take the expectation. So numeraire at evaluation time, maybe I also define this. This is the numeraire at evaluation time. So I need the numeraire at the initial time. Let's keep fingers crossed that this works. I calculate the expectation and take the double value. Oh, I did something wrong. Ah, okay. I didn't calculate the option uh, because I need to apply the payoff. Yeah. So the payoff is, this is just a forward. Yeah. So the payoff is the underlying minus the strike and that float at zero. So take the maximum of this and zero. So this variable was called option strike. And yeah, of course, I need to discount the payoff and not the uh, underlying. So let's hope that works. Okay. And now you see, uh, there is another step of abstraction I would like to introduce. Yeah, uh, I have now a very nice specification of the model and the process, which is encoding these three lines. But here, yeah, I had very explicitly the financial product. So now I write here the financial product in terms of the stuff provided by my process. So maybe I can introduce now another level of abstraction, abstracting the simulated model and the financial product. So this is now model and product. Yeah? Previous step was model and numerical scheme. Now model and product. So I would like to separate the 
valuation code of the financial product from the actual model used. So I have now a machine that generates the market observed quantities. Yeah, so it's generating the X. And I would calculate like to calculate from that a future value of the financial product. And then I take just the expectation of this V of capital T. And the motivation comes a little bit from development cycles you see in the industry. In the industry, it's a little bit that new models are introduced quite slowly yeah, because new models are adapting to changes you observe on the market. For example, interest rate became negative. Yeah? Suddenly, a log normal model for interest rates is no longer suitable. So you change the model. So you change the machine that provides the X. But then the development cycle for um, a financial product is usually quite fast. Yeah, So there is a client that likes to say, uh, I would like to have an option, but my option should not pay maximum of blah, blah, minus strike. It should have a small modification. Yeah, Only a, visit, only a percentage of the underlying or an Asian option. There should be some averaging or whatever. So you need to change the function applied to this X. So the development cycles of the model part and the product part, they are quite different. And so you would like to separate the development of these two parts in your uh, library. So I would like to value different financial products with different models. So I introduce now an interface. So my universal pricing theorem reads like this. There is a stochastic process describing the model. I now have a numerical machine that creates the X tilde approximation to this X. And then these Xs are the input to some payoff or evaluation function. So this is my function V. And then, yeah, I take the expectation of V, actually V divided by the numerea at observation time, multiplied with the numerea at evaluation time. So you see the lines that I did here. Yeah? So this is the dis discounting of the V. So just take expectation. So taking expectation yeah, means I just apply a method on my random variable implementation. And there is now a problem. So the problem is maybe already visible here in my implementation. And it is actually this part here. So I'm asking my process, give me X of zero, X tilde of zero. So X tilde zero yeah, of that time index TI. So I have some secret knowledge that my model feeded into the Euler scheme will result in S being the first component of the axis. Okay, here it's clear because I just have a one-dimensional stochastic process. So there is only an X zero and my model was specified in a way that it creates the S. But I could also have an interest rate model and in an interest rate model, maybe the first component is just the forward rate for the first interval. The second component is the forward rate for the second interval you know, from, well, you have some time discretization of the interest rate curve. Or you could have um, a Heston model where the first component is the S and the second component is the V, the sigma squared. So how do we know which index here refers to which simulated quantity in the stochastic process in on the market. So the problem is, what is the interpretation 
of X tilde. Yeah, so the thing is, X tilde at a certain time is actually a vector. X tilde, yeah, so I'm a programmer, I start now from zero maybe. X tilde zero ti to X tilde, and maybe I use now D minus one of ti. So now you have to ask yourself, who has knowledge about this? So it is the process model. So the process model defines the stochastic process. So for example, for the Black-Scholes model, it tells you the component zero here is the S and the numeria is provided by a different method. The numerical scheme is just stupid. It just generates X tilde and N tilde without actually knowing what is the interpretation of this object. Is it a stock? Is it a volatility? Is it an interest rate? So I would like to have a wrapper now that provides for the financial product a method such that the financial product can just ask, give me the value of the stock and give me the value of the numerea without the need to know which index is associated with this. So example for this problem is for the Black Schultz model, you have the X is just the S, Bachelier model, but for the Heston model, actually the X is a vector, S and V, it's a vector value process. It's also an example for a process that has a two factor Brownian motion, yeah, because the S and the D, V, the D, v, uh, the V has independent or correlated, yeah, you see there's a correlation here, um, increments. And for an interest rate model, you could have that the X is actually a vector where all the components define interest rates. So I now combine the model and the process into something that I call a simulation model, maybe long name. And this will provide to my financial product the simulated coordinates under a good name. Okay, maybe that was a long explanation. If you look into the code, you see that it's actually a trivial thing. Let's look for this asset model Monte Carlo simulation model. So this guy is here. And you see now, instead of having get numerea and get process value, and I do not know what is the process value, I just renamed the method to get asset value. And you can now take a look at the implementation. Yeah, for example, there's the Monte Carlo asset model. So this is an asset model. So this takes just the Euler scheme process. And then if somebody is asking for, give me the stock, give me the asset, he is just calling the process with the corresponding index. You see a little bit clearer what is happening if you look, for example, at an interest rate model. So for an interest rate model, I have the same situation. So there are interest rate models here. Yeah. And there is a LIBOR model. So the LIBOR model now specifies a method get LIBOR. So this is the forward rate. Yeah? Maybe a better name would be get forward rate. And if you now look into implementations of this, you see there's a whole white model, a LIBOR market model, many different models. So if you look now into an implementation of this, you see that under this name, there's also just the Euler scheme process, give me the process value at the corresponding time index. So it's him that knows how the indices map. If you would now have a hybrid model where you combine interest rates and uh, stocks, so assets, yeah, the whole thing could be wrapped into two methods that map the corresponding market quantity to the 
a corresponding index in the stochastic process. And it's you that decides yeah, which index is where. So this is just a small uh, wrapper. So interest rate models are not the focus of this lecture. And now with this interface here, I can now define the valuation of a financial product. So financial product valuation. So the financial product valuation is now given by a function. This function is just get value and it gets as an input my asset model, uh, my asset simulation model. So the one that provides get numeria and get asset value. Uh, there is a subtle thing here. I just return here the um, discounted payoff in this method. So you see, I return here a random variable. So this random variable is returned here. And then you can still decide if you would like to work with this random variable or if you would like to take the expectation. So the value of my financial product is the expectation of this random variable returned here. So let's complete now the session by looking at different product implementations. So I have the model, uh, the quantities generated by my Euler scheme now under a proper name. And then I have different product implementations. So we already looked at the interface for the model. So this is the interface now for the model. It just provides these two things asset value and numeria. And now I would like to look at different financial product implementations. So you see there is models here and products, different product implementations. And you see there are many different products here, Asian option, basket option, Bermudan option, somewhere also European option. So let's have a look at the European option. So the European option now implements a method called get value. This method gets as an input the evaluation time and the corresponding model. The model provides the value of the stock and the numeria. So I can fetch the S of capital T at the corresponding maturity. I can calculate the payoff, yeah? S of T minus K, maximum of this and zero. Then I can calculate the, I can fetch the numeria at maturity. I can fetch the numeria at evaluation time. And I divide the payoff by the numeria at observation time, multiply with the numeria at evaluation time. And I return this value. So this is a bit trivial. Yeah, it's actually implementation of this function here, of the payoff function. You see also that the model can provide weights in case you like to do weighted Monte Carlo. Yeah, So it's a little bit designed for extension, but here in our case, the weights are always uh, yeah, equi-weighted. Yeah? So there is no weighted Monte Carlo. For the Asian option, yeah, the Asian option has a maturity and the strike, but it also has a vector of times for averaging. So an Asian option is not paying maximum of S minus K and zero. It's paying maximum of A minus K and zero. And this A is the average of the stock observed at different times. So for the Asian option, my valuation code looks like this. So this is the get value. It just gets my model here. So it asks the model now for the underlying at the different times, calculates on the random variables, the average of this underlying by just summing it up and dividing by the number of times, calculates the payoff 
performs the division by the numeraire, multiplication with the numeraire, and returns the value. So for the Asian option, the payoff is a little bit more complicated. So all these products now, they do not know which model was used. Yeah? It's just the definition of the product. So I have now a nice abstraction of yeah, the model that just provides S and N and the different products. If you like for illustration, you can have a look at this little unit test. So I have a few minutes left. Let me complete our um, example from the last session. Now, using this, yeah. so I just throw all this away and I create now a product. So this is an asset Monte Carlo product. So this is my product. So this is a new European option with the option maturity and the strike. And my value is just, so take the product and get the value at evaluation time with the corresponding model. So model, now I need my simulation model. So this is my asset, mon this was that ugly long name. Uh, maybe I use Monte Carlo asset model. This just gets the process. So this is just this wrapper, this wrapper that wraps the get process value into the get asset such that the financial product knows uh, what the quantity is. Yeah? So maybe I call it simulation model to distinguish this a little bit from this process model. Uh, what is the problem here? Ah, so this returns a random variable. I would like to have the expectation and the double value. Yeah, this is now the final code we have. All the components are now separated. Yeah, random number generator, time discretization, Brown in motion. The model that we would like to simulate the Euler scheme process, the financial product, maybe I should move this here below. So I feed the process into the wrapper that tells me, okay, this is, um, this, this is a model that simulates stocks. Uh, such that the product knows, okay, I can I can get a stock under that name and I can calculate the value. So let's run this guy again. So analytic value, the classical loop, the Java streams, and the random variable implementation. And the funny thing is that actually this guy, which has all these components nicely sorted away, is the fastest one apart from the analytic uh, solution. So I would like to conclude with this remark that you can have also a look at this guy here. So this guy now combines the model and the implementation of the product using many different models. So I have here a collection of say three different models with many different products and calculating the value in a code that uh, is very um, agnostic. Okay, so you can find this here in Monte Carlo valuation experiments. Yeah, uh, This is in the experiments repository. Okay, so in this, this package here, so let's have a look there and then we are done. So in the experiments repository, I have a Monte Carlo valuation experiment. So similar to our previous experiment, I specify a few model parameters, but now I also have a Heston model. Yeah, so there are a few additional parameters. I have product parameters, time discretization, oops. Time discretization, Monte Carlo parameters. And you see, 
I create here a list of such process models, Black Scholes model, Bachelier model, Heston model. So Bachelier model has as the volatility parameter sigma times s, so that the price will be similar to what you would expect from Black Scholes. Yeah. But this here is the initial value. This is constant. I also have Heston model. Then I have a list of different products, European option, Asian option, yeah, the one with the averaging, this here is the time discretization for the averaging of the stock, a Bermudan option, an option on an option, we will discuss this later. And then I just have a generic method, print valuations here below, that takes a list of models and takes a list of products and calculates the value. So this guy knows nothing about which model was used, which product was used. So it's asking this function here, create a Monte Carlo simulation out of the model. So this function is below. It's exactly what we had. Time discretization, point in motion, Euler scheme with the model, wrap it into our asset model. And then it has the Monte Carlo simulation and feeds this into my product to get the value. Yeah, you can now run this code and uh, see that this really works. Yeah, so we he's calculating for different models, the different prices. So in this case, you see that um, the Bermudan option has a higher price than the European option because the Bermudan is an option on an option. So you can gain a little bit more out of this. The Asian option has a lower price because it is averaging. So the volatility is gets smoothed out. And you also see that the prices differ. You know, if you look at the different uh, models, okay, this is just because I have some model parameters uh, that uh, differ. Yeah? So the, the impact of the model could be in one direction or in, in, in the other. Maybe I run it again, and there is a small subtle effect. You see that the first price is taking a little bit longer, and then the Asian option is coming instantly. So the reason is that um, I'm caching internally the simulated quantities. Yeah. So the brown in motion is generating the random numbers and then internally caching it. The Euler scheme is generating the market observable and then internally caching it. So there is a cache at work. And this means that if the first product has been valued, the second product can reuse all these values. Well, that's a small performance aspect. Okay, here in, on the, in the script, you also find this little code of our last um, experiment combining all these classes. And that was it for today. That was a session on implementation. And we will return to a very nice numerical method, the variance reduction in the next session. That was it for today. Thanks.